Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. You will recall that we just finished making a carbide insert hand scraper, and you will also recall that I freely admit I have no diamond grinder with which to sharpen that scraper. So, we're gonna build one. We're gonna use the induction motor that I took out of the lathe when I upgraded it and added a VFD, and we're gonna make all the parts to turn that into a grinder. Let's go over to the bench, take a look at what we have to work with. This is the motor that came out of the lathe. This is a one horsepower induction motor, and this is definitely overkill for a grinder project, but uh, the big advantage of a motor like this is I have one, and it's sitting right here, not doing anything in my shop. It is a little bit squeaky, but once it comes up to speed, uh, that isn't an issue. It's a much bigger annoyance on the lathe where you're constantly turning the, uh, the, the chuck to adjust things. Uh, in the grinder, it's not going to be a big deal, plus this thing is not going to run that often. Uh, for abrasives, we're using these diamond lapping plates. These are just eBay specials, 600 grit, 1500 grit, and 3000 grit. The heavier grits will be for shaping the carbide insert, you know, putting a radius on it. And then the finest one, the 3000, will be on there most of the time for uh, actually uh, honing and putting an edge back on the scraper as we use it. This is just a steel plate, six inches, 150 millimeters in diameter, with a half inch hole in the center. And yes, it is actually half inch, it's not a metric size. And then one side of this is sputtered, or I'm not sure exactly how it's made, but it has a fine diamond coating on it. So then to turn this thing into a grinder, we're gonna need some kind of platen or some other kind of attachment mechanism to put this on the end and then of course, a tool post or something to hold the part that's being ground. In addition to mounting the abrasive, we need to wire the motor. Now, I've got this just wired up with things flapping in the breeze uh, here just to do some testing. And yes, the motor does indeed run. Let me switch it on here, hold it down. You can hear the squeak as the centrifugal switch uh, makes contact as it spins down. Uh, let's talk about how this thing is wired. So this is a single phase dual capacitor AC induction motor. Uh, 110 volts, 13.6 amps producing one horsepower. Um, this is uh, for 60 hertz use and at 60 hertz this produces 1720 RPM. So this is a uh, four pole motor a uh, two-pole motor would be running at double this, 3,400, 3,600 RPM. And that's what you'd find in a typical bench grinder. Like if I just went down to Harbor Freight or Grizzly or someplace and bought a low-end bench grinder to convert for this application, it would be a 3,400 RPM motor or 3,600 RPM uh, no-slip motor. And that, I think, is, is too fast for this. Now, I think it would work just fine but I would actually prefer the slower speed with the diamond grinding plates just to, to make it a little bit easier to handle. Now, this is a dual capacitor motor. There's two capacitors. C1 is 150 microfarads, and that is this one, and C2 is 20 microfarads, which is this one. Now, the two different capacitors serve two different purposes. The 20 microfarad capacitor is a run capacitor. That's gonna be always switched into the circuit while the motor is running. And usually what that does is the, through that capacitor, it energizes the second set of coils in the motor, which then creates a rotating magnetic field. The first capacitor, C1, is larger and that is a start capacitor. That's usually only switched in to the motor when it's starting and it dramatically increases the starting torque. And I believe the switch that disconnects this once it's running is what you're hearing when this thing squeaks. Not absolutely certain, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is because as soon as it spins up, that stops. And when it's spinning down, you hear just before it stops, you'll hear that, that uh, suddenly click and cut back in. So I think that's the centrifugal switch that's making that noise. Now this is a six terminal uh, uh, strip here on the top of the motors. There's six wires that go down into the coils, and the wiring diagram shows how everything's connected. C1, the 150 microfarad, is connected between these last two terminals, between V2 and W1, 
and then the C2, the run capacitor, is connected between V1 and W1. And so those are connected permanently there. And then the other, the four terminals on this end, you have two choices of how to wire it. You can wire it as you see, I've used this diagram here and I've shorted across these two terminals, W2 to U2 and U1 to V1, and then attach the power to those leads on the end. And that will cause the motor to spin in one direction. If instead you move, rotate this 90 degrees and put the shorting bars this direction and connect the power here, then the motor will run in the opposite direction. And I just tried, uh, there's no indication here as to which is which, so I just tried one. You can see I've wired this up here on the end, which is this diagram here, and it spins counterclockwise when you're looking at the face of what will be the diamond lapping plates. And that's ideal for this uh, situation because then any torque that you apply, any drag caused by grinding will tend to tighten the screw in the end of the shaft rather than to loosen it. So this is the, definitely the direction that I want the motor to spin. Now, because this is AC, if this were a DC motor, you could change the direction just by swapping the two power wires. But because it's AC, there's essentially no polarity difference uh, between the hot wire and the neutral. And so swapping the wires won't make any difference. The motor still runs the same direction. You actually have to change the way the coils are wired if you want to go the other way. Now I suppose the motor is technically running. I could just go ahead and make the grinder and leave all this stuff flapping in the breeze. But I want to button this all down, seal it up, keep the grinding dust out of it, keep fingers out of it, and create a nice neat little package that'll keep this all protected and keep me protected, of course, as I'm operating it. So to enclose the electronics, um, it came with, the, the motor had on it this little terminal cover that goes over the, over the contacts and then the cable comes out. And that's fine if you get another box like the lathe had to contain the capacitors. And in the case of the lathe, there was also a contactor and a bunch of switches. But I don't have that here. I've just got the motor. So what I want to do is put a larger box on the top of this that will hold the capacitors and contain all the wiring and give a place for a switch uh, and a nice solid place to connect the power cable. And so what I'm going to use is what's called a bud box. These are made by bud industries. They've been around forever. And this is just a injection molded ABS plastic. And it's sold as I think it's a utila box is what they call it. It's just an electronics project box. And if you've done any electronics work, this is the typical kind of box that you would put that in. So it's just a two part molded uh, ABS enclosure. And these come in a whole bunch of different sizes. They're relatively inexpensive, and this stuff, again, being ABS, is very easy to machine. The one thing that is nice about the bud boxes, as opposed to some of the cheaper alternatives that had been around at Radio Shack for decades when that was a thing, is these actually have threaded brass inserts in the corners, so you can take the screws in and out uh, over and over without chewing up the plastic. Some of the less expensive boxes just have self-tapping screws that go into the plastic. And so the idea is cut some holes in this so that it will fit down over the terminals. And so the terminals will be inside here, give you a place to wire those. Capacitors will fit in here as well. And this will also give us a place to mount a switch, hook up the cable gland, and have a nice enclosed uh, wiring solution here on top of the motor. This is the switch that I'm planning to use. Uh, this is just a little illuminated, neon illuminated rocker switch. Actually, this one might be LED. I'm not sure. I haven't opened it and don't plan to. Um, I just took this out of an old plug strip. So this is rated uh, 20 amps at 125 volts AC, which should be plenty to handle the 13.6 amps of this motor. Now, technically, in this kind of an application, you would want a horsepower rated switch that can handle the inrush current of the inductors in the motor. Uh, I think this is gonna be light duty enough that it's not gonna be a problem. The motor's not gonna be under heavy load when it's starting because we just have the, uh, uh, the lapping plate on it. Um, this isn't gonna be used all day, every day. If it does fail, uh, this is a standard size switch. It'll be easy to get another one and replace it with something a little bit more robust. But this one was free out of an old uh, damaged plug strip, so 
I will just use it and I think this is gonna be fine. And then the last piece of the puzzle is the cable gland and I bought a large package of these in the, when I was doing my CNC mill and you've seen me use these in other projects. Uh, this just screws into a hole in, a, in, a, in the enclosure, there's a little nut down on it, and then the back has a little rubber insert and these fingers so that it can crimp down on the power cord. And this power cord is actually the power cord that I recycled from the lathe when I did the VFD upgrade. Okay, this is the overall concept for the grinder. We've got a motor, we've got a platen on the front to hold the diamond lap, and we've got a box on top to hold the electronics. Now, uh, if you take a look at this motor, this is not exactly the same as the motor that is on my lathe. Um, you, can, you can see this particular one, this is a D80 metric motor, but it's not, uh, it's not the same thing. It's actually got a casting with ribs. This is something that I found on a supplier website, and I'm just gonna wave my hands here. The motor that we're actually gonna be using has a flat top on it with a gasket surface for a, an electrical box to connect the electronics. We don't have that here, we're just gonna pretend that we do. But the overall dimensions are about right. So this six inch wheel is gonna just clear the surface that this is bolted to. If it didn't, we'd just put some spaces, but spacers underneath it. But ultimately this is gonna be sitting on some kind of a platform and then we'll have the diamond lap on the wheel here, the capacitors and everything's up here in the box and then there'll be some kind of a structure out here in front for tool rest. And that could even be something that's replaceable or adjustable or has pivots for grinding radii. We'll get to that uh, a little bit later. The whole purpose of this box ultimately is to have some place to put the capacitors. There's, uh, on the actual motor we're using, you know, this is a surface we can bolt down to on the top of the motor and the terminals for the motor are right here. Um, and we're gonna bolt around that and have that open to the inside of the box. Now, for the enclosure, I chose a Bud box. This one's made by Bud Industries. It's a CU3283. And they're available in all kinds of sizes. You know, they're like 10 bucks. It's not a big deal. And as an added convenience, most suppliers, and I think uh, Bud themselves, but uh, most suppliers are gonna have 3D models for these boxes that you can download. And that's exactly what I did here. This is just the box. Um, I can show you the box. So this is just a model of the box that I downloaded off of the supplier's website uh, and imported here into Fusion 360 as a step file and then did a little bit to actually connect, you know, create a rigid group and put everything together so that it'll move around all as one unit. Now this box is about the right size. I just roughly modeled these capacitors. Um, to connect it down to the motor, we can't just bolt the box directly to the motor because there's a nameplate under here with some rivets that make it stick up and then the fan shroud on the back sticks up even further. So we need some kind of a spacer. So let me turn off the box and let's take a look at what we've got here. This is the spacer and it's a rectangular um, extrusion. And in this case, I'm gonna probably 3D print it but I could just as easily mill this out of aluminum. And it's got the four holes to match the hole pattern on the, uh, on the motor. And this will sit down around the terminal and then the box will sit on top and it'll have to have a hole cut in the bottom of it as well with four screws that will go through the box, through the spacer, into the motor, and holding everything in place. Then that'll give us a space in here where we can drop in the capacitors, hook everything up, in the side of the box here, we've got room for the switch. Back here, we've got room for the cable gland for the power to come in, and uh, we should be golden. Throw the cover on it, and we've got a complete self-contained unit. Now, to attach the diamond lapping plate to the front of the motor, we need some kind of platen. And this is what I came up with. If you look at the motor itself, the motor has a 19 millimeter diameter shaft with a six millimeter square key. And it's not shown in this motor, but there's also a tapped M6 uh, screw thread in the end that was used to hold the, the pulley on here. So the pulley goes on, it's a close fit over the shaft, it's keyed so it can't rotate, and then a screw in the end holds it on. And we're gonna use that same attachment uh, mechanism for the platen. 
So this is the design of the platen, and you can see it's just a, a collar that goes around. This will be a 19 millimeter bore that closely fits with a keyway cut in it. Now, I did a couple of things here. One, I did not want to take something, a piece, you know, six inches or six and a half inches in diameter of aluminum and three inches long, and then on the lathe, turn all of this into chips. That seems like a real waste of material. It takes a long time. It's probably gonna be real stringy. So instead I opted to make this in two parts. So this is two, mil two inches in diameter. We'll probably just go 50 millimeters so we can clean it up nice. Board out with the keyway. And then the platen is attached to the front of it with screws. So we can very easily make this part we can shape out the keyway, more to come. We're actually gonna to try to do that. We're gonna to try to CNC shape that vertically on the mill. That'll be an interesting project when the time comes for that. But we can, this is a simple piece of turning, put in the keyway and then put in six holes on the mill. Then we can make the platen also on the lathe, flat and round, and then go the, over to the mill and put in the hole pattern to attach that down with the screws then we can always chuck this back up in the lathe, indicate it in, and then round this out and make sure everything is absolutely concentric. And in fact, the rotation speed of this motor is 1750 RPM, so we really could even put this on the motor, attach it, spin it 1750 RPM, the rim speed of this is still gonna be under 3000 surface feet per minute, which is acceptable for carbide cutting aluminum. So we could even, flatten this out spinning on the motor. We'll see if that's necessary. If I can get it spinning within a thou, I won't bother. But you know, if we end up because the motor shaft's not perfectly straight or because of some other imperfections or just because I screwed up, this thing ends up wobbling a little bit. Maybe we can find a way to mount the motor on the ways of the lathe and actually use the carriage to face this off with it actually on the motor. Now these screw heads are going to be sunk below the surface and so the diamond lapping plates which I don't have shown here are six inches in diameter with a half inch hole. We'll turn this little nub in the center to fit that perfectly and register it and then there will be some kind of a round cap maybe made of steel maybe made of aluminum with a hole through it to accept the M6 screw that will go through this into the end of the motor shaft to hold everything in place. Now the lapping plates are not necessarily flat. I've checked, I have three of them, I've checked all three. And uh, the situation is two of them do sit flat on a surface plate and if I press down in the center they stay that way. The third one, actually the 3000 grit one, is not flat. I've done a little bit of massaging on the side of the bench. I think I can get it to, to lay flat, but we will find out when we get this whole thing together. Now there are several parts again, like I mentioned, that are not here yet. There's no tool rest, there's no base. I'm still waiting to have some really brilliant ideas for how to do those. If you've got great ideas for how that should be done, throw it down in the comments. Uh, when I come up with something, you will be the first to know. Well, this was just a short intro to the project. I think the first part I wanna start on is the electronics enclosure. I'm anxious to get the wires protected and not just flapping around in the breeze. The CAD is done, so all we need to do is 3D print some parts, mill out the openings in the enclosure, and put it all together. And we will start on that next time. If you're enjoying these videos, please give me a thumbs up, feel free to subscribe to the channel, and leave me a comment. I'd like to know what you think. Thank you for watching.